most instructive example to look at for analytic continuation not by power series but by other techniques like integration by parts would be the gamma function. I presume all of you are familiar with the gamma function but just in case we would like to see uh, to get a sort of uh, complete picture of it. Let me repeat information which you probably already have. So let us start with the way the gamma function originally got defined by Euler. He noticed the following, he noticed that the integral from 0 to infinity of uh, dt t to the power n e to the minus t was equal to n factorial for n equal to 1, 2, 3 etc. It is a trivial integral to do, you integrate by parts and you get this uh, answer here. Now of course if you put n equal to 0 then you again get unity. So you could in principle use this integral to define 0 factorial. So you could say integral 0 to infinity dt t to the 0 t equal to 1 is equal to 0 factorial. So you can use this integral to define what is meant by 0 factorial which as you know is taken to be unity and the reason is this in this fashion. Okay. Now the question is what is this by the way what does one uh, do for computing large factorials? If you have a little pocket calculator you can compute the factorials by pressing this button but then at some point it shows an error message when the number becomes greater than 10 to the 99 typically. Right? When does that happen? So no one has a calculator, things have become much more. When does it happen? What factorial is greater than 10 to the 99? Pardon me? Around 70. Around Around 70, yeah. 70 I believe is when it will get, it will show an error message. So this means that beyond 70 you cannot compute factorials using this uh, thing, it is bigger than 10 to the 99. So we need an approximation or we need a formula for computing. Uh, the factorial, you need the factorials very often, you have combinatorial problems involving more than 100 objects and then of course immediately you need n factorial. Typically you have n to be Avogadro's number 10 to the 23 so you certainly need uh, the factorial and there is this famous approximation called Sterling's, Sterling's approximation. I should call it Sterling's formula because it is much more than an approximation as you will see. It has the seed of uh, something very general in it. And that gives you an expression for the factorials. What is Stirling's approximation by the way or formula? It says n factorial is equal to, the first term is n to the power n because it says n times n minus 1, n minus 2, etc. Set them all equal to n and you get n to the power n but that is an overestimate. So you got to compensate for it and the compensating factor is e to the minus n. Hmm? And then there is a square root of 2 pi n that comes out as a very small correction to it when you take the log of n factorial then these things will separate out and the leading term is n log n and then you subtract n and then there is plus half log 2 pi n. So this is a logarithmic correction but actually this turns out to be part of a series there is a 1 and then a 1 over 12 n plus order n squared. This is an infinite series on this side, the next term is of the order um, 1 over 300 times 312 times n squared or something like that. So these are powers of 1 over n, it keeps going. So it is actually telling you something quite remarkable, we will come back to this in a minute. This is Stirling's formula, we will uh, come back to this in a minute but I would like to ask you how you get this formula, how would you get this formula, what would you do? Yeah. Yeah, you do what is called a Gaussian integration, use the fact that you have uh, then you know what the integral of e to the minus x squared does. So what you do is the following, you realize that as a function of t, this factor t to the power n increases like this, t squared, t cubed, etc. get flatter and flatter and increase more and more sharply. On the other hand, e to the minus t decreases like this. This starts at 1, the finite value, goes sharply to 0. This guy starts at 0 very flat and increases to infinity, not quite as rapidly as this drops but still it goes up. And clearly when you have something which is 
going to be 0 multiplying some large but finite number you are going to get 0 as the answer. So, the product of the 2 is clearly going to look like something of this kind and the idea behind Gaussian integration is to say that the contribution from all these things is going to be negligible in the limit when n becomes very large you are just going to get a contribution from this little portion there. So, you might as well replace this by a Gaussian integral from minus infinity to infinity and say that is the first approximation to it that is the idea behind Gaussian integration and the way it is implemented is to say that this integral here I first write it as 0 to infinity dt e to the power minus uh, t minus n log t. So, I write t to the n as e to the n log t and then it is this guy here to integrate it out here. Now, this thing here this function when this function near 0 is near 0 or near an extremum that is when this is going to contribute the most this integral the rest of the time it is going to die down. So, let us see where this function has an extremum you have f of t equal to t minus n log t. So, f prime of t equal to 1 minus n over t equal to 0 at t equal to n hmm. we got to make sure and ask whether this is a minimum or a maximum. So, f double prime of t equal to n over t squared which is equal to 1 over n at t equal to n. So, let us expand this this is equal to integral 0 to infinity dt e to the power now the first term is n minus n log n that is f of n the next term is t minus n f prime of n but f prime at n is 0 and the term after that is plus t minus n the whole squared over 2 factorial which is the same as 2 times f double prime that is a 1 over n plus corrections in this fashion. Now, look at this integrand by the way this correction terms are sitting in the exponent, but I could bring them down and expand them out in powers of t minus n or something, but the leading behavior is going to be given just by what we have written down already. So, this whole thing is constant. So, you can write this as therefore, n factorial is n to the power n that is e to the n log n that is n to the power n and then there is an e to the minus n and then an integral 0 to infinity dt e to the minus t minus n the whole squared over twice n and then 1 plus dot dot if you are interested in finding the other terms you need to do those guys here. Now, it can be shown fairly rigorously quite rigorously that if I extend this integral from minus infinity to infinity then the correction is exponentially damped it is exponentially small and what does this tell you this is just a Gaussian integral here. I shift to t equal to n and the integration region is still minus infinity to infinity and this immediately tells you since we know that uh, integral minus infinity to infinity e to the minus a t squared equal to square root of pi over a for a such that the real part of a is positive it immediately tells you at once this is approximately n to the n e to the minus n square root of 2 pi n that is Stirling's approximation ok and you can find the correction systematically by using this you have to be a little more careful, but you can write the corrections now. I already mentioned that the first correction is 1 over 12 n to unity. Hmm. So, you can see immediately that even for n as big as 1 as small as 1 that is the first integer you have you still have a correction which is you have an answer here which is correct to something like 92 percent because the correction is 1 part in 12 you have 1 plus 1 over 12 and if n is of the order of 10 then the correction is of order 1 percent if n is 1000 then it is 0.1 percent and so on. So, the correction becomes smaller and smaller after all if you put this equal to that for n equal to 1 the question you are asking is how good is it to say that e 
is approximately equal to root 2 pi. And the statement is it is good to 90 percent, hmm? the two different numbers altogether. So, this is not such a bad approximation, it is actually a quite an accurate formula. By the time you hit n equal to 100 or 200, it is already quite accurate, very, very accurate. Hmm? This is the power of this saddle point, this uh, Gaussian integration that the error is actually exponentially down when you leave, leave out the rest of it, when you extend this region of integration. So, this is a very familiar trick and we might use it again. again. Anyway, so what this tells you is a formula for n factorial, but coming back to the original definition. The question we could ask is I have integral 0 to infinity dt t to the power n uh, e to the minus t equal to n factorial and Euler introduced an integral where for conventional reasons for historical reasons it got shifted. So, let me call this n minus uh, 1 and he called this the gamma function of n where n runs 1, 2, 3, 4, etcetera. Hmm. This is the Euler gamma function. It is n minus 1 factorial hmm. and n is 1, 2, 3, etcetera, etcetera. But now the observation is that I do not need to restrict myself to values of n which are positive integers. Hmm? After all, I can use this formula. Now, look at it instead of n, let us call it a complex variable z, and we have defined it for n equal to 1, 2, 3, etcetera, and they are just the factorials of n minus 1. Hmm? So, gamma of 1 is 1 that is 0 factorial, gamma of 2 is also 1 that is 1 factorial, gamma of 3 is 2 and then gamma of 4 is 3 factorial which is 6 out here etcetera. And this formula actually provides you with an interpolation. It actually makes sense if instead of n you replace it by a real positive variable x and let us go the whole hog and replace it by a complex variable z and call this gamma of z. If you actually draw this graph and you do the integral numerically, then you discover that you get a curve which looks like this and increases extremely rapidly. In fact, we know how fast it is going to increase. It is going to increase like x to the power x because the leading term was n to the n and then there is an e to the minus x sitting there. So, it increases faster than any power, faster than exponentials and so on. On the other hand, if you put this n equal to 0 or z equal to 0, this integral is dt over t which is bad news at the origin and it blows up. So, indeed if you do this integral numerically you discover that there is a divergence here at 0 and it looks like this. So, what I have plotted is x here versus gamma of x which makes sense as long as this integral exists and when does it exist? It exists as long as this number, this exponent here is greater than minus 1 or x greater than 0 in this region, but I could also make move into the complex plane instead of x I will call it z now and give it an imaginary part. Will that change the convergence of this integral? When does this converge? Converges in the variable z, where does this integral converge? Well, it converges as long as z minus 1 is greater than minus 1 or z greater than 0, but z could be complex, could have an imaginary part. Now, it is obvious that if in the z plane I move into, I look at the imaginary, I give it an imaginary part, this integral will continue to exist as long as the real part is greater than 0, because that is the only thing that controls the convergence here. If I write z as x plus i y, there is a term. So, I have t to the x plus i y minus 1 which is t to the power x minus 1, t 
t to the power i y but this is e to the i y log t and its magnitude is unity it is bounded it just oscillates it does not affect the convergence of the integral at all. Hmm? What affects the convergence of the integral is the value of x and we require x to be greater than minus uh, greater than 0 we want x minus 1 to be greater than minus 1 or x to be greater than 0. Now in the complex z plane this is x and this is y where is this region we want x to be positive so you want this region here real z greater than 0 that is the region of convergence of this integral is that clear yes everybody agrees so this integral defines an analytic function explicitly analytic function of z defined in the region real z greater than 0 namely the right half plane in the complex plane and when z hits positive integer values like 1, 2, 3 etc then this function reduces when z hits the value n this function's value reduces to n minus 1 factorial otherwise it is well defined by the integral explicitly that is an explicit representation for this function in that region. We suspect there is going to be some trouble with this function on the boundary of this convergence region of convergence. So I expect that gamma of z which is analytic in the right half plane in this region has one or more singularities on this line just as when we defined a function by a convergent power series I said that this function is bound to have at least one singularity on the circle of convergence in the same way when I define it by a definite integral of this kind and this region is bounded by this line here I expect that somewhere on this line at one or more points this representation breaks down because there is a singularity of some kind I would like to find out what this singularity is right. okay. now what should one do well why did this thing break down it broke down because of the behavior at of this factor t to the z minus 1 so let us write this out now I have gamma of z I define to be 0 to infinity dt t to the power z minus 1 t to the minus t and in the same breath I write real z greater than 0 that is the region in which this integral makes sense and gives me a finite value for any z in this region and it is this region I would like to go to the left of this region and see whether gamma can be analytically continued what was the factor that gave me trouble this factor here and that arose because of this power here if this power had been larger then you would have no difficulty at all so what should I do to make this power a little larger how do I increase this power integrate by parts I keep I integrate by parts so let us write this as equal to t to the power z minus 1 uh, t to the power z over z e to the minus t uh, t equal to 0 to infinity and then minus an integral 1 over z comes out 0 to infinity dt t to the power z derivative of e to the minus t is a minus sign so it gives me plus I still have real z greater than 0 so let us keep writing it like that I have just integrated by parts so the real z has to be kept greater than 0 otherwise the original integral did not make sense but what is this equal to well at infinity this factor is going to kill everything it is going to go to 0 what happens at t equal to 0 this just gives you 1 what happens to this factor <coughs> t t is 0 so what happens to this factor it vanishes provided this is true provided this is true if you said z equal to 0 that is not true anymore provided that is true 
it vanishes, right? But we have kept z in that region. So this is definitely 0 at all points in the z plane to the right of z in the imaginary axis, this is 0. So I can also write gamma of z as 1 over z integral 0 to infinity dt t to the z a to the minus t real z greater than 0. I have not done anything. So I got an alternative representation for the same function which is point by point equal to the original representation, no difference at all. But there is a pole explicitly sitting out here at z equal to 0 and where does this integral converge? To the right of real z greater than minus 1. So what we have discovered is that this function has a pole here and we have got an integral which converges here. So apart from that pole, this representation is now actually valid for real z greater than minus 1 and there is an explicit pole in this point. So we have found an alternative representation which is valid in a bigger region and it also exposes the singularity at z equal to 0. It is a simple pole because if you put z equal to 0 in this, you just get unity and therefore the coefficient of 1 over z is 1 which means it is a simple pole with residue equal to plus 1. Of course, this has got a regular part at z equal to 0. So this whole function has a singular part plus a whole regular part. So near z equal to 0, this is of the form 1 over z plus regular part near z equal to 0. Near z equal to 0, that is definitely true. Hmm? So we conclude that this gamma function has a simple pole at z equal to 0 with residue plus 1. But now I can play the same trick. I want to go further to the left of this. I do the same thing once again. I integrate by parts once again and then what is going to happen is that you are going to get the same gamma of z equal to 1 over z and now I integrate this by parts. So I pull a z plus 1 and then an integral 0 to infinity dt t to the power z plus 1 e to the minus t. Pull this down. Where is this going to be convergent, this integral? This is greater than real z plus 1 greater than minus 1 or real z greater than minus 2. So and what about the behavior at z equal to minus 1? It is singular. What sort of singularity? It is a simple pole which is explicitly sitting here. And what is the residue at that point? You got to multiply by z plus 1 and then take the limit. Now if you multiply by z plus 1 this goes away that gives you unity and this gives you a minus sign. Huh? So this is equal to minus 1 over z plus 1 plus regular part near z equal to minus 1. So what is a pole at z equal to 0 is quite nice at z equal to minus 1, there is no problem, it is just values minus 1. Hmm? But it contributes to the residue at that point hmm? and so on. So what would you guess is the general structure of this function? I continue here, this is <laughs> 0, this is minus 1, I continue next time, it is minus 2 and so on. So what would you conclude is? about the structure of this function? It has simple poles at all the non-positive integers 0, minus 1, minus 2, etc. So in general it has got a simple pole at z equal to minus n and what is the residue at that point? Minus 1 to the power n because this thing is going to alternate in sign. So gamma of z is a meromorphic function.
with simple poles and residue minus 1 to the power n. Uh, oh yes, 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 it is minus 2, yes, because this is going to go on giving you z plus 2, z plus 3, etc. So, indeed, minus 1 to the power, thank you, and factorial. Yeah. Yeah. So, what we have done is analytically continue this gamma of z by this trick of integration by parts, strip by strip by strip. Hmm? You could ask can I write something which is one shot, it is valid everywhere, shows the poles explicitly everywhere. After all, when I do this n times, I end up with something which is still valid only in a finite region. So, this is equal to 1 over z times z plus 1 dot 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 up to z plus n integral 0 to infinity dt t to the power z plus n plus 1 t to the minus t or whatever z plus n sorry. But this integral still is convergent only for z greater than minus n minus 1 real part. So, at some finite point it stops and I can keep doing this, but the question asked is can I write a single formula down valid everywhere in the complex z plane? We will do that when we talk about branch points and I will show you there is a master representation you can write this down, but this is as good a method as any step by step by step strip wise we can analytically continue this. What was the basic trick? The basic point is to note that this function obeys a functional equation and that equation is simply that gamma of z plus 1 is z times gamma of z that is all that is needed. So, the moment I wrote 1 over z that integral out there t to the power z instead of z minus 1 that was gamma of z plus 1 and I bring the z to the left hand side and you get this functional equation. Therefore, I can write gamma of z plus 2 as in terms of the lower power z plus 1 gamma of z plus 1. So, z times z plus 1 gamma of z and so on and so forth. And this functional equation is what enables us to do this analytic continuation strip wise in this fashion. So, that is another trick if you find a functional equation you can write this down immediately. For instance, suppose you took the derivative of the gamma function what happens then suppose you took well, this functional equation it is clear there is a z sitting here. So, it is a natural thing is not to take the derivative of the function directly, but to first separate these two as a sum and then take the derivative. So, what should one do? How do you convert a product to a sum? <coughs> take log. logs. So, define psi of z equal to d over dz log, log the logarithmic derivative. So, this is equal to 1 over gamma what is the functional equation satisfied by this psi of z take logs on both sides and then differentiate. So, you get psi of z plus 1 minus psi of z equal to 1 over z. I take the derivative of the log derivative of this the 1 over z and then I bring this psi to the left hand side. So, this is the functional equation satisfied by this psi of z function. What is the singularity structure of psi of z? Where do you think it is going to be singular? You see near the point z equal to minus n gamma of z has poles at all these points right. It's got poles at zero, minus one, minus two, minus three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So near z equal to minus n, gamma of z is guaranteed to be of the form 
minus 1 to the power n over n factorial z plus n plus a regular part. It is guaranteed to be of that form. Okay. So now I do this, I differentiate and then divide by the gamma of z. If I differentiate this part, it is again going to be regular, but I differentiate this part, it gives me a z plus n whole squared and then I divide by this portion by the gamma of z itself. So what do you think psi of z is going to look like at that point? This will imply that psi of z equal to, again there is a regular part, And I am going to differentiate this, so there is going to be a minus 1 over z plus n whole squared, but I divide by this whole thing divided by z plus n, so one factor of z plus n is going to cancel out and then this minus to the n, n factorial is going to cancel out hmm? and what is going to be left? Just minus 1 is going to be left, so it is going to be minus 1 over z plus n plus a regular part. So what is the conclusion? That psi of z, the logarithmic derivative of the gamma function is also a meromorphic function. It has got simple poles at all the non-positive integers with a residue that is however a constant, minus 1 at all those points. Okay. Finding this is a different story. Finding this is a different story. We need to do that carefully. Okay. We will do that. We will see what the Euler constant has to say about it. But this tells you the structure of both gamma of z and this. Now the question we could ask is just as we wrote down yesterday a mittag leffler expansion for this function cosecant squared or cot pi z and so on, can we for this meromorphic function write down such a representation? Can we write? Well we have all the poles, we have minus 1 to the n, n divided by n factorial z plus n. The question is can we write down? an explicit representation for it or not. Now how would one do that? Well, this requires a little bit of work. Remember that the original integral was 0 to infinity dt t to the power z minus 1 e to the minus t in this fashion and then I did integration by parts systematically till I got to this stage and then I pulled out the residue at this point here. So what one has to do near the point z equal to minus 1 is to recognize that somewhere along the line this integral that I have there that z plus n, so let us look at that t to the power e to the minus t and then there is this factors 1 over z, z plus 1 up to z plus n. It is this factor that gives trouble at the origin here and it gave trouble due to this 0 sitting here. So what one does is to break this up into an integral from 0 to 1 dt etc plus integral 1 to infinity dt in this fashion here. Hmm? You could have broken it up at any point here but I am going to leave it to you as an exercise. I am going to write this out and ask you to do this in detail to show that this breakup will lead you to the mittag leffler expansion for the gamma function. So this is the portion that is actually going to be the regular part here and all the singularity is going to come from this portion here, this integral here. That is the precise division that you have to make, no other point will give you the exact mittag leffler representation and we will see how that emerges. There are several other things, we are going to come back to this formula, we are going to write down what this part is, what is this regular part especially at z equal to minus n similarly for the gamma function. So we will try and write down more analytic properties of this and I want to show you a product representation for this gamma function. Related to it there are other functions, there are other kinds of integrals, there is the famous Euler beta function which is actually the Euler integral of the first kind and let me quickly, let me write that down, introduce it and then we will come back to it and that function is defined in the following way. Again you define it through an integral. And this time the integral runs 0 to 1 dt t to the power instead of z minus 1, some m minus 1, 1 minus t to the power n minus 1 
and this is written as beta of n and this is the definition where m and n are non negative integers 0, 1, 2, 3 etcetera. But if it is 0 it blows up so m n to start with are positive integers. Now this factor is going to start diverging due to the lower limit of integration if m hits the value 0 and then if it goes negative it is worse. This factor is going to start diverging if n hits the value 0 because of this limit upper limit of integration here. Again you can try to improve matters a little bit. First of all instead of m comma n you can define this of two complex variables. So let us write this immediately as z and w call this z call this w and where would this integral converge? where would this converge? It converges as long as this exponent is bigger than minus 1 the real part of this exponent right. So clearly real z greater than 0 it converges as long as real w is greater than 0 in these two complex variables. So as it stands this provides a representation for this analytic function in this region and this is by the way called the beta function. So in two complex variables in the plane uh, two complex variables now so here is w and here is z it converges in this region and in this region. Okay. I would like to improve matters a little bit. So again I do the same thing I integrate by parts if I want to improve this to real z greater than minus 1. I integrate this by parts but what happens to this? I integrate this by parts I increase the power but what happens to this? It's that gets differentiated uh, the power de decreases. So you can find an alternative representation after one integration by parts integrate this and differentiate that which will actually be good in this region in z but in w it is going to shrink in W it will be good only in this region. If you tried it the other way it would just reverse roles. So it is clear this beta function cannot be improved it is uh, region of analyticity cannot be made bigger in both variables together by this trick of integrating by parts you are stuck completely. There are other ways of doing this and we will come across a contour integral we will derive a contour representation for it which will again tell you how to do this in general. But there is yet another way and that is to define that is to show that this beta function is related to the gamma function and then we know everything about the gamma function so we can use that I will show subsequently that this function is actually equal to gamma of z gamma of w over we will derive this identity between the two functions and once you have that then all the analytic properties are completely known once again. So we will take this up a little later after we talk about branch points but meantime I wanted to show you that this integration by parts does not always work when you have this kind of problem then it is of restricted use but in the case of the gamma function it worked completely okay. So let me stop here today then we will take it up from next time. Any questions? Yeah. Well there are general tricks a few general tricks but in general yeah in on the whole you have to do this on a case by case basis. You have to know something about the analytic properties of the function uh, where it is valid and then depending on what representation you have or, or you need you look for you look for functional equations you look for tricks of that kind yeah. What is uh, interesting is that the law of permanence of equations so I will make a, a few comments on this afterwards after we do a little more analytic continuation about the uniqueness of such continuation.
and this idea of permanence of equations. So when you have an equation between two analytic functions in some region, then when you analytically continue these functions, that equation is going to be true still provided both sides can be continued. And that is because you can subtract one side from the other and call it 0 and that is of course analytically continued to every point everywhere. So in that sense um, the continuations of these functions will continue to satisfy the same equations. And one important lesson is that when you deal with differential equations, special functions and so on, you must think of them as functions of a complex variable. Both the dependent and the independent variable are complex variables. In fact, even the parameters in the equation should be regarded as complex variables and then you get a full picture of it. We will we'll do, we will talk about the Legendre functions and then I will show how this works. So you not only do you have to think, you are used to PL of cos theta where L is 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. and cos theta is uh, some number between minus 1 and 1. So the first thing is you can define a PL of Z which is a complex variable not restricted to minus 1 to 1, not just the real axis either, all the entire complex plane. The second thing you can do is to make L a complex variable. So it is really a function of two complex variables and that is the way one should think about it. And then it has its analytic structure becomes very clear. Okay. Thank you.